So, ladies and gentlemen, I'll put the microphone up. Welcome, welcome. Uh, can everyone hear me at the back? Is that okay, uh, audio-wise? Brilliant. Okay, welcome to uh, History of the English Language, the second part of the Structure and History of English series. Um, this course uh, is going to take you all the way back to the beginning of English. So, presumably most of you are familiar with the modern English period, or you won't understand what I'm saying right now. Um, the early modern English period you'll probably already be familiar with, because in school you get to study Shakespeare, um, whose birthday it was yesterday, I believe, or was it the day before? Uh, very recently, English Language Day, a uh, very important day. Um, Middle English and Old English, on the other hand, um, are a little bit less familiar to most people. Uh, and so I'm just going to give you a flavour of that now. Um, so here we've got a passage of Modern English. Um, it's from the Bible, just from the Bible because the Bible goes back quite a long way. Um, so here we have, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. This is from the New International Version. Date is important here, 1973, right? So more or less contemporary. Um, now, when we look at early modern English, it's more or less the same thing, but we can see a few differences in terms of the, the words here. So, for instance, um, fowls, for instance, uh, for a certain kind of bird. Um, this is not a very common word in the modern language. It still exists. It's actually related to uh, German Vogel, in fact. Um, words like devour, they're still okay in modern English, but they're rather archaic in their connotations. Um, and as for behold, this is really not something that you'll hear English people saying very often. Um, so, um, that's the early modern English period. But I think you should pro probably all agree that this doesn't pose any great difficulties of comprehension. Right? You can all understand what this means. Um, now, when we get back to Middle English, and here we've got the Wycliffe version from 1395. This is a controversial Bible in its day. Um, here we start with, lo. Right. I, th I think I should probably start my lectures like that in future because it has a great rhetorical effect. Lo, um, and we have um, other words that may be completely unfamiliar like yeder, um, meaning went. Right. Um, and we've got endings also um, that you don't see in the present day anymore. This eth ending, um, this he that soeth, soeth and so with an E on the end, which would have been pronounced in this time period. We'll talk more about that later in the course. And uh, bridis of the air, birds of the air, kamen, came, and with an N on the end, and eaten and eaten hem. Not them, hem. That also is significant in ways that we'll see later on. But again, if you're following, and it's, it's relatively early in the morning, but, but by German standards, I think this is okay. It's not 8.15. Um, so if you're following, you should be able to understand what all of this says, okay? Not a problem. 13.95. It's, I mean, it, it's getting a little bit trickier now. Um, right. Uh, here we get to Old English, and this is really a whole different kettle of fish. Um, as a, a language, uh, this is almost completely impenetrable to people who don't have specific training in reading it. Um, most certainly English native speakers will have no clue what this says uh, unless you uh, specifically train them in how to read them. Um, so um, the whole thing, you might be able to recognize some bits um, as being uh, related to what we have in the modern language. Um, so we have, for instance, Sad and sad, seed. Now, this is the word for seed. Um, we've got a he here. That's not too bad. He. And here um, we've got uh, full glass, which is this word that we saw in modern English as well, right? Um, foul, right? Or vogel. And we will see this um, kind of thing again. Um, actually, when you start looking at the structure of this part of the language, um, this is something that looks a lot more like German than it does English in certain ways, which we will explore. 
Um, and the actual text I've given you here, you can actually go and see it online. Unfortunately, the resolution is not that great here, uh, but you can see the, the text here. And you can see that even the alphabet is not quite the same. So we have letters here uh, that might not be familiar to everyone in the room. We've got this th. This is a th. It's a thorn, it's called. Uh, so, sordliche. Um, and we've got this uh, A and an E that are kind of mashed together. This is, this is called ash. Uh, and uh, this kind of uh, symbol uh, you will see quite a lot when you work with Old English. Mostly it's the Latin alphabet, but with some tweaks and modifications. So this, and that's going back just over a thousand years to West Saxon Gospels. Um, so this is where we're going to get to in the course. Now, obviously, um, there will be no requirement for you to fluently read uh, this kind of language. There are very few people in the world who can, but to have some sense of the structure and the history and the identity of this kind of language is kind of important, and that's what we're going to aim for in this course. So, um, for now, some practical information uh, about how the course is going to work. Um, first of all, the thematic area um, hopefully should be fairly obvious to you. This course really does what it says on the tin. We're going to cover the history of the English language. Um, and we're actually, um, just now we went backwards in time to the Old English period. We're actually in the main bulk of the course going to go forward in time. We're going to start with the prehistory of English and then we're going to move on to the Old English period and Middle English and we'll get closer to home as the course goes on. Um, so that's the general structure. We'll be talking about internal changes, so structural changes in the history of the language, um, history changes also that are due to language contact. So English, like all other languages, does not exist in a vacuum. It's constantly being affected and affecting other languages. Um, and due to its position, especially during its early history in the British Isles, uh, it, this, it's had some very interesting uh, effects. Uh, and in fact, right now, uh, there are very interesting things going on in terms of language contact and its effects on English. Um, and as I've said, we're going to cover the whole language. This is a full service course, uh, both in terms of giving you an idea of the structure of the language, the flavor of the language, the Sprachgeist, uh, but also uh, the texts so that you can, uh, to a certain extent, actually get something out of these texts, read them, appreciate them. If not understand them in full, then at least know something about the context and um, the flavor that these texts yield. Um, there is a textbook for the course, and this one you can buy. It's a very uh, uh, straightforward one, and I'm going to be following the textbook fairly closely for this course. So this textbook is Van Gelderen's uh, History of the English Language, um, and this is the revised edition. Um, if you uh, see the cover of this book, it actually says revised edition on it in the bottom left. Um, so ideally, I want you to get your hands on this um, revised edition, but the first edition will do the job too, if you need it. Um, so if you can't get the second edition, but only the first edition, um, that's fine, we can make do. Um, there is a companion to this textbook, um, and you can find it here. These slides uh, are on Ilias, so all of the links, you don't have to write them down. Uh, you can click through to them later on. So, uh, that's what, what I'm offering. Um, here's what I will be assuming from you. Um, so, uh, She 1, uh, Structure and History of English 1, is a prerequisite for this course. And from this course, I will be assuming um, that you have a basic knowledge of certain things. Um, so. For instance, English phonetics. Um, I'm going to assume that you're all basically familiar with the international phonetic alphabet. Um, you don't have to be phonetics professionals or anything like that, uh, but some idea of this alphabet and how it works will be useful to you. Um, morphology also, I'm going to assume that you know what things like um, nouns and verbs are. I'm going to assume that you know what things like accusative and dative are most of the time. Um, and uh, if uh, you don't, then there are various recourses available to you. 
Um, you can look it up on the internet, which is the easiest way. Um, you can read the textbook, which is probably the second easiest way. Um, or you can ask the tutors or me. Uh, but we, we have possibly varying tolerance depending on how stupid the question happens to be. Right? So um, if you, yeah, um, try and save intelligent questions so that I'll be really impressed. And then, and then stupid questions, look them up on the internet. Okay, um, but chapter two of the textbook does contain some refreshes about these basic uh, aspects of the history of the language and uh, basic aspects of the structure of the language uh, that you will need. Uh, my name is George Walkden. Um, I'm extremely new here. Um, so if you want to know about how something works in this university, there is a good chance that I will not have a clue. Uh, and if that is the case, then we can find out together. Uh, so, it's an exciting journey of discovery for everyone, um, but um, <clears throat> uh, I will hopefully uh, get better at these things as the course goes on. Um, from May onwards, the most useful office address for me uh, is G116, oop, sorry, ah. uh, G116. Uh, which I will be in from May um, because it has a really nice view of the lake. I really like this office. Um, and um, this is down in the G building, floor one. Um, I've got office hours, and those are Tuesdays at 2 and Wednesdays at 10. Uh, so you can come and see me during those times without making an appointment, and uh, you can uh, get sage advice on any number of complex and important topics of the day, but preferably something to do with linguistics or English. So, um, you can also email me, and you can make an appointment if you can't uh, find uh, time to visit me on these particular hours. All right, um, so, uh, the lectures themselves, uh, you've all figured out where they are and when they happen. Um, they are here and now, and uh, the slides will be made available 24 hours in advance. So, I won't be providing you with any printed materials for this course. Um, but if you want to print them out in advance, then you can, um, and you can use the slides I will provide online to do that. As a nice feature of these lectures that will hopefully make things uh, all kinds of user-friendly for you guys is that I will, be, uh, I will not personally be recording, but these guys at the back will be recording. Um, this is the uh, streaming team, and they will be videoing and audio recording and capturing the slides, and there will be a nice uh, multimedia uh, captured version of these lectures uh, for your uh, use. So for revision, uh, this is a really handy tool, I hope, because it means that you won't uh, have to keep frantically taking down notes of everything that I say. Um, you can rewatch. Uh, you can slow things down so that I speak really, really slowly. And then you can listen to things over and over again. Um, and uh, that is hopefully going to be a helpful revision tool for you um, as you progress in this course. It means that we'll have to do things a certain way. So for instance, if you ask me a question in the lecture, um, so uh, please uh, do feel free, if you have a question, uh, to stick your hand up and ask. Um, but uh, if you do have a question, um, I will probably repeat it before we actually, uh, before I answer it, because it will then be recorded uh, on the uh, podcast for the world to hear. So again, probably for your own, uh, own self-respect, ask good questions, not stupid questions. Um, assessment is very straightforward. There's an exam. It's at the end of the course. This exam, I don't yet know whether it will be in week 13 of the semester or week 14 of the semester. Um, we are going to organize it so that you don't have all of your exams on the same day. That is the, con that is the constraining factor here. So we're trying to be quite user-friendly. Um, and I will let you know as soon as it's decided whether it will be in week 13 or week 14. Does anyone have any questions right now? Okay, maybe you're all too scared uh, to be recorded for posterity asking a question. Uh, but. Uh, do feel free. So, another important aspect of this course is the tutorials. Um, we're going to be covering in these tutorials uh, material that is uh, set during the lecture. Um, particularly, there'll be exercises uh, for each week. 
Uh, and there are three tutorial groups uh, and two tutors uh, covering both of them. So uh, Thomas Conrad and Christoph Dreyer, who are down here, could you stand up and uh, give us a wave? <laughs> we'll get the camera to rotate. Um, all right, brilliant. These are our two tutors, and uh, they will be able, uh, if you find me incredibly intimidating, um, then you can ask them, and hopefully they will be uh, less terrifying and able to help you with any queries that you might have. Okay. Uh, and finally, on the practical note, I think this is finally, um, the syllabus. So we have the good fortune this year that this course falls on a Monday, and that means that there are holidays. So next week, for instance, there will be no lecture. Uh, and also, in week seven, there will be no lecture. Um, the lectures will take place in all other weeks up until week 12, and then the exam will be in either 13 or 14, depending on what we decide. Um, and as you can see, we're going to cover the whole history of the language. We dwell a little bit more on Old and Middle English because they're harder. Right? So these stages of the language are more difficult for you to understand, and therefore you need to spend more time wrapping your head around them. Uh, and that's why we have two lectures on Old and two lectures on Middle English. Right. So let's move on now to where this language comes from the English language. Uh, and here, we will be focusing, at least for now, on the British Isles. Uh, not just because I like the British Isles and I'm from there, but also because uh, in the very earliest periods of English, uh, this is where it came from. And that is interesting when you consider English in its present-day context. There are, I think, more non-native speakers of English now than there are native speakers. There are speakers around the world. Uh, and, uh, in fact, this little country, England, is relatively unimportant in the grand scheme of things, though if you tell the English people that, they're usually not very happy. So, um, let's talk a bit about where this language came from. So, the British Isles. In the most ancient periods, of, we know that there were people there an incredibly long time ago. So half a million years ago, there were people in the British Isles. Uh, well, hominids, I should say. Whether you want to call them people is another question. Um, they, well, parts of them looked like this. This is a tibia, a bone, uh, from an early hominid from the British Isles, from a town called Boxgrove in the south of England. Now, these guys, uh, they weren't speaking English. They weren't speaking anything. They were probably making sort of inarticulate sounds and banging sticks against rocks and uh, doing other kinds of things that um, early hominids like to do. Um, so we don't need to uh, worry ourselves too much about them. When it gets interesting is when modern humans come into the picture um, with language, and 10,000 years ago, uh, humans start to reoccupy the British Isles. 5,000 years ago, um, they built this thing, um, which is a bunch of stones on top of other stones. Uh, and uh, then we start getting humans and peoples that we can recognize. We can start saying interesting things. Um, first of all, we get the Celts. So about 3,000 years ago, uh, Celtic tribes migrated from Europe to uh, the British Isles. Um, and in fact, this is where the word Britain, British comes from. Uh, most likely, um, these tribes, one of these tribes was called something like the Pritaini, uh, and that name got carried over to uh, British uh, and Britain uh, in, uh, even up to the present day. Um, and these Celtic languages are still around, though they're in varying states of health. Um, so, uh, if we look at our little map of the British Isles, uh, when you look at uh, Wales, there are still Celtic speakers, Welsh speakers around there. Up here in Scotland, uh, especially in the north, you've got speakers of uh, Scots Gaelic. Uh, and in Ireland, too, you've got Celtic speakers. They're on the, uh, what is at least sort of, uh, in terms of uh, technology and urbanization, mostly the periphery. Uh, of the country, these Celtic languages. But at one time, uh, this would have been the only game in town. These are the only languages that would have been spoken in the British Isles during this period. 
So um, the Celts were doing uh, reasonably well in their own happy little way, and then along comes the Roman Empire, 2,000 years or more ago, um, and the Roman Empire at its height was absolutely huge. Uh, I don't need to dwell on the historical details, but most of Europe and uh, indeed parts of Northern Africa uh, and Western Asia were under Roman rule. Uh, and at varying degrees, at varying times, uh, there was Roman control in these provinces. Um, the British Empire, the, sorry, uh, the Roman, the, the Roman, uh, the um, British Isles were on the very periphery of the Roman Empire. Um, so uh, th as far as the, uh, the Roman Empire uh, didn't stretch any further, I mean, there isn't much further to go because once you go past Ireland, you just get to the sea, and then there's a lot of sea until you get to America. Uh, but the Romans weren't interested in going that far. So um, the British Isles were the limit of their empire. It was always a sort of a rather strange outpost that they used for certain metals that they found in great quantities in uh, the British Isles, for instance. Uh, and the northernmost limit is this lovely wall that you can still see today, um, Hadrian's Wall, uh, that was built in uh, 122 AD, uh, and that was there to keep out the Picts, uh, of Scotland. Um, and uh, obviously there have been various interesting linguistic things going on, as there always are when two different peoples come into contact. You've got this very technologically advanced, rather high status uh, Roman civilization encountering the Celts, um, and so you get Latin contact with Celtic. Again, this is all way before we have anything like English on the scene. Uh, but this sets the scene. This is what we had before anything like English emerged. So, next, various things happen that involve Germanic peoples coming to the British Isles. Um, so, uh, here you can see uh, various different uh, Celtic tribes or organizations. Um, we've got in the center of uh, of the, uh, of the island here, the British. Um, we, the, this term, in, in, this, in this historical context, British does not mean just from the British Isles, it means a specific Celtic tribe. So you've got these British uh, speakers, you've got Irish people, or um, actually they, they would have probably been called Scots at the time, in fact. Uh, and then you've got these Picts, who were in all likelihood also Celtic speakers, though we don't know for sure. Um, and these people, these, these Irish and these Picts, were putting a lot of pressure on the British down here. Um, so the Brits were not happy, uh, and they, according to the traditional story, decided that they were going to look for outside help, right? Uh, and since EU funding was not available in those days, um, they had to call upon these guys, the Saxons, and they called upon the Saxons. So the Celtic king, the British king, Vortigern, contacted his uh, friends, Hengist and Horsa, um, for help against the Picts. So they said, well, we're being seriously pressed by these Picts and these Irish coming and attacking us and trying to take our land and our sheep and everything, and now we need your help, and we'll pay you. Uh, and obviously that starts out well, and it doesn't end so well. So after a while, the Saxons realize that they are tougher than everyone else, and they can push these Brits around. And so they come, and they settle, uh, and they turn against their former employers, and they establish a permanent foothold. And these Saxons, along with other Germanic tribes, were, they brought with them their language, which was a Germanic language. And this Germanic language is the language uh, that ultimately became English. Um, so this date, 449, is usually thought of as the starting date for the English language. There was no English before this, right? 449 AD, um, you get English. Now, this story is a very nice story. It's a little bit suspicious, right? We don't actually know um, much about this period. What we do know, uh, we know from archeology, span increasingly from genetics, um, uh, and it's difficult to really pin down what was going on. 
uh, because the contemporary chroniclers, the people who were writing during this time, they themselves were not always very reliable. They had their own biases, and we don't have very many sources. Uh, and one thing that might make you, be, might make you uh, a little suspicious is these names, right? Hengist and Horsa, right? Hengist is just the Germanic word, uh, well, in German you, you still have it, right? Hengst, right? Um, it's a, a stallion, and Horsa is a horse. So these, these two guys were supposed to be just called horse and horse, basically. Who, who, invites, who invites a couple of mercenaries called horse and horse to come and help them take over a country? Um, and in fact, when you look back at the mythology of the early Germanic peoples, and in fact the early Indo-European peoples more generally, I will explain terms like Indo-European in more detail next time, um, but when you look at these mythologies, you find that common to various different traditions, including the Sanskrit tradition, uh, is this story of two brothers who rode horses. Right? So this is a very common story. So it could be that at least part of this story is really more mythological than real. Right? Nevertheless, it's the best story we have, and so we continue to tell it. Um, but what we do know uh, is that during the first half of the 5th century, uh, we get Anglo-Saxons being found, for instance, in burial sites um, and uh, Anglo-Saxon material uh, remains, material goods, uh, in the British Isles. And so we can tell that there is at least something to this story. It was around this time that the Angles, the Saxons and all of the rest came over to the British Isles. Now, the Saxons are the main ones. They didn't come from present-day uh, Saxony. Um, they came from the north of Germany. Uh, so they came from uh, the places where people these days speak Plattdeutsch. Um, and the Saxon that remains is very interesting in its own right. It's usually called Old Saxon. Um, and uh, we have records of that that go back a long way as well. But we're not going to cover those in this course because we part company from all of this stuff that happens on the continent, and we now talk more exclusively about um, the uh, isles themselves. Um, but the, the, the tribes that we see settling are the Angles, the Saxons, the Frisians, and to a certain extent, the Jutes. The thing about the Jutes is that we don't really know where they came from. So we know where they went. They went down here. This, this little dotted line shows where the Jutes went. They went into Kent, and they went to the Isle of Wight. Um, and those are the two main places that the Jutes settled. But we don't know whether they came from down here, sort of present-day Netherlands, south of Holland, or up here, north of the Angles in Denmark. Um, the Angles we know more about. They settled in places in this side of the country, um, and more to the north. Um, so here uh, we have an area that is called East Anglia, named after these precise angles. Uh, see, these names stick around for an incredibly long time. Um, we also, um, the, um, the, the Frisians, there were Frisians who settled. We don't know so much about what happened to them. Um, but uh, it looks like they probably did better than they did on the continent because now there are not so many Frisians and they're not very important. Uh, apologies if there are any Frisians in the room. Uh, that was not a sort of a, a value judgment, more a sort of objective statement. Um, so, um, but the Saxons, um, the bulk of the uh, force that came, the, uh, the settlement comes from these Saxons and they come down to this southern area. Uh, and if you know anything about the geography of the United Kingdom, um, you know that there are counties called Sussex, Essex, and Wessex. Now, these counties um, are named after the different kinds of Saxons, South Saxons, Sussex, East Saxons, Essex, and West Saxons, Wessex. And uh, those Saxons, you might wonder what happened to the North Saxons. No one knows. No one knows. It's a mystery. If you can find the North Saxons, then you will be the heroes of English historical linguistics. Uh, but uh, people have tried to no avail. So we don't know about the North Saxons. But uh, there were lots of these Saxons. And in particular, the West Saxons 
become very important later on. And when we talk about the history of Old English, Wessex and the West Saxons uh, will have a particular role to play. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Okay, good. <clears throat> so, uh, these periods, I alluded to them earlier on. Now, of course, any language is a kind of fluid entity in the usual sense that we understand it pre-theoretically. So, when we look at the history of English, um, it's not the case that there are easily identifiable discrete chunks that the language divides up into. Nevertheless, people like to divide them into chunks, and when they do, uh, they usually do so based on some uh, linguistic dates, linguistic properties, and some historical properties. Um, so, for instance, the Old English period is dated from 450, because in 449 we have this classic date, and, and on, um, in 449 the Germanic tribes began to settle uh, in Britain, in the British Isles, um, at least according to Bede's story. Um, Bede, by the way, uh, also known as the Venerable Bede. Uh, there are very few people in English history known as Venerable. Um, I hope to one day be one of them, the Venerable George. Um, but I'm not there yet. Uh, maybe a few more grey hairs. Um, Bede uh, is a very important historical source because he was one of the few people during the Old English period to be writing about the history of the British Isles and the British peoples. As I've said, he was biased in certain ways. Um, but um, we can still take some of what he says at face value. Uh, we have to be a little bit careful. Um, anyway, we have this date, 449, and uh, so we can say that that's when the Old English period starts. From this time onwards, English exists. And the word English, uh, as you may have twigged already, English comes from Angles. Right? So there are the Angles of the Anglo-Saxons, and these Angles spoke Anglish, or as it later became through sound change, English. Uh, English. Um, so Old English uh, is spoken up to about 1150, uh, this particular boundary is rather fluid. Um, so sometimes people date um, the uh, end of the Old English period uh, a little bit earlier. Um, but uh, from somewhere between 1050 and 1150, Old English stops, Middle English begins, and we see with Middle English texts are written that look really quite different. Linguistically, their actual properties are quite different. So when we get to this stage, uh, the Peterborough Chronicle, um, we can start calling this, these texts Middle English. Uh, and Middle English goes on until about 1500. Why 1500? Again, well, first of all, it's a nice round number, right? Uh, historians generally like numbers that end in zeros. Two zeros is, is like the best possible prize. So 1500, it's a great, nice, round number. So is 1700. But 1500 actually means something as well, because during 1500, um, this is when the great vowel shift, which we're going to come back to later in the lecture, um, was underway. Um, and also, at about this time, printing was introduced, the printing press. Uh, and it's hard to overstate the importance of the printing press uh, in the history of the language, because for the first time, suddenly texts could be uh, multiplied uh, thousands of times uh, around the country, and lots more people had access to written material than ever would have previously been possible. Uh, this is comparable in some ways to the rise of the internet over the last 50 years in terms of its impact as a technological revolution. Um, but printing was just one of the factors, of course, uh, but it's a nice convenient one because it happens to uh, occur at around this time. In fact, uh, the uh, Gutenberg Press, uh, we, well, the um, Caxton uh, and the uh, first uh, printing set up in the United Kingdom, or, well, uh, that's a very anachronistic term. It wasn't united at all then. In the British Isles, let's say. Uh, the first one uh, was in the 1470s, so a little before this date. And the technology became mainstream shortly after that. 
the modern English period, which we're going to spend less time on in this course, uh, is from 1700 until the present day. Uh, and again, there are no really neat dates here, but there are lots of important historical events. Um, so we get the US Declaration of Independence in 1776. Uh, and this is important because actually from the early modern period and before, uh, all of the texts that we have are, are from the British Isles, pretty much. There are a few texts from elsewhere, um, but uh, not so many. Now, uh, of course, um, a small minority of the texts produced in the English language are actually produced in the British Isles. Uh, now, geopolitically, America, Canada and Australia are all uh, much more influential in certain ways. Um, so, um, this, uh, but this development, uh, this spread of English around the world is also an important part of the history of the language, uh, an important part of understanding how it's got to be the way it is today. The other important fact um, that's around this period um, is that the great vowel shift um, is roughly complete. So we get to the point where uh, this, um, this huge, I can describe it for the moment simply as a huge sort of thing that messes up all of the vowels. Um, and uh, I will elaborate upon that later on. Um, it's almost finished by, by 1700. So it's just about started in 1500 and it goes on for 200 years and it's almost done by the point of 1700. Um, obviously, um, you must never fall into the trap of thinking that people suddenly woke up in 1700 on the 1st of January and thought, ah, we're speaking modern English and all of our vowels have changed and the syntax has changed too. All right, fine. You know, we'll deal with it. It was New Year's, New Year's Eve, we were, we were hung over, it's fine. You know, uh, but this doesn't happen, right? Language changes gradually uh, and especially when it spreads through a whole population. Uh, so these periodizations really are arbitrary, uh, but for your purposes, they will help you get some sort of flavor of the language and, and how it's traditionally divided up by historians. Um, and it's useful to be able to divide text up in this way uh, if only because it makes it easier to have uh, lectures on Old English, lectures on Middle English, and everything is much neater that way. But obviously reality is never as clean cut as that. So, Probably the most important question then, why? Why bother? Why are we here? Okay. And one reason, one very good reason, is that you have to be. Um, and if you have as part of your course requirements that you have to take this course, well that's fine. Uh, and uh, make the most of it, I guess. Um, you could also be studying the history of English because it's interesting, and this is also true, at least in my opinion. Um, but um, there are other reasons too, and we'll uh, touch a little bit now on, on some of them. Um, first of all, um, some things in present day English really don't make much sense. And they only start to make sense when you look at them from a historical perspective. Uh, this is a classic uh, example of English spelling. It's often attributed to the playwright George Bernard Shaw. It probably didn't come from him, but either way, it's a good illustration. Um, the English word fish could equally well, in terms of the way English sounds map onto spellings, it could equally well be spelled G-H-O-T-I. Why? Because the string G-H can represent the sound F, as in the word enough, right? The G-H in this word is pronounced F, enough. There are other words like this, um, trough, for instance. Um, <clears throat> what about the O? Why an O? Well, in the word women, the O uh, in the spelling corresponds to an i in the pronunciation, just like the i in fish. And as for the sh, well, the sh corresponds to ti in nation. Sh, nation. Okay? So, G, so this, this word, um, G H O T I, would, in, under certain circumstances, be a good representation of the sounds that we find in the English word fish. Um, and uh, as I'm sure many of you will have grappled with over the years, English spelling is full of horrible, horrible things. Um, and much 
worse in this respect than many other languages you will encounter. Um, and one thing you might ask is why? Why do I have to suffer in this terrible, terrible way learning all of these awful words and their stupid spellings? Um, and uh, there is an answer. Uh, the short version of it is that English spelling underwent a process of standardization before uh, certain major sound changes happened. So this spelling is a historical relic. Um, we can think of English spelling at one point as having been much better at representing the sounds of the language than it is today. So then there was this process of standardization, and then there was this process of sound change, uh, the great vowel shift that I mentioned earlier on. And we're going to talk about all of those, but before doing that, we'll have to clarify some basic notions. Um, so first of all, the English language, again, like any language, is not some sort of monolithic entity. Um, linguists often distinguish between varieties of various kinds, um, and the most important for your purposes are regional varieties, social class varieties, and registers. Now, regional varieties are those that are specific to an area, so these are often called dialects. Um, so, and in, in German, uh, you have the term uh, Mundart uh, for some of these varieties with slightly different connotations. Um, so, but those are spoken in specific areas. Uh, there are also linguistic variants, linguistic varieties, that are associated with certain uh, social groups or classes. Um, this is uh, very strongly uh, uh, represented in the United Kingdom, which has a very uh, comparatively rigid class structure. Um, but uh, in, I think, every uh, society that I'm aware of, there are some linguistic forms that are used more by people who are better off, and uh, some that are used more by those who are worse off. Um, and styles, uh, linguistic varieties, can be uh, associated with uh, specific groups. Uh, so, for instance, linguistic variants can represent uh, not only regional origin, but also, for instance, uh, ethnicity or um, gender or sexuality. Um, and uh, all of these things can be represented uh, in, in language. Um, the word for this kind of variant, this kind of variety, is a sociolect. So just as a dialect is a geographical variant, a sociolect is a variant that's specific to a particular social group. And then finally, the dimension that it's, that's important is um, register. Now, different registers are typical for different occupations or situations. If you go to the bank, you may use a different variety than, for instance, if you're talking uh, to your cousins who live in a small village somewhere in Schwaben. Um, so, um, these different registers are also important. Um, so, even individuals, of course, um, can speak in different registers depending on the situation that they are in. And you can think of this as level of formality. I put a little box on the slide here illustrating formality. Um, but there's a real asymmetry here because it's not the case that these varieties are all valued the same. Right. It's often the case that certain dialects, certain sociolects, are regarded as inferior, are judged. If you say certain things, um, you will be judged, you will be uh, seen as stupid or lazy, right? just based on the linguistic varieties that you use. Um, the variety that has the highest prestige in this sense, the variety uh, that people want you to speak, is the standard language. Uh, and the standard language is usually the variety of a social, a particular social and or regional group. And this is never an accident. So um, typically, uh, the standard variety is associated um, with uh, the center of power in a given country. It's associated with people who are wealthier. It's associated with people who are better off. Um, usually, um, sometimes also, um, <clears throat> uh, especially in the, in the modern day, uh, white people, men, uh, and uh, there are many uh, values 
uh, and prejudices that go into this kind of calculation. Um, but these are uh, varieties that are taught in schools. They're the ones that journalists, politicians typically use. They're the ones that you see everywhere and that you think of as your basic, uh, your basic, this is, this is English, right? The standard English, the Queen's English, they sometimes say. In, in, the, in the context of British English, it's the Queen. Um, now, in fact, that's, that's a joke because no one speaks like the Queen. And if you listen, it's actually, you can go and, and listen to the Queen's, she gives speeches every year. Like, she's, she's quite old now, but she still finds time to say, to talk for five minutes. And she has this very special variety, which has rather interesting phonological features. Um, and, and there have been linguistic studies of the Queen, uh, because obviously one of the interesting things about the Queen is that she is in a particular socioeconomic class, which has no other members. It's just her, right? She's the Queen, she's the boss. Right. Um, so um, the Queen is very interesting from a linguistic perspective, but I think I'm getting sidetracked. Um, so uh, the standard language is obviously a formal variety, right? Um, if you think of uh, Hochdeutsch in the sense uh, High German, in the sense that that you would uh, use it, um, the the situations that you would associate it with are probably formal situations. Uh, these uh, very practical, formal situations. Um, and this is also a variety that has grammars and dictionaries. It's associated, it's been described. It's been described very thoroughly. And not only has it been described, it's also been prescribed. So this is, people say not only this is what standard German looks like, this is what standard English looks like, but this is the language that you should use. This is the language that you must use. And this kind of uh, prescriptivism is very common in public discourse. Now, it's very important to clear up one thing from the start, and I'm sure you all know this. This, everything that's on this slide should really be background information for you. Uh, but it's very important that we are taking a descriptive approach rather than a prescriptive approach. Sometimes when I say that I, study, I do English linguistics, people say things like, oh, I, I, w I need to watch the way that I speak around you. No, no. I do not, I'm not in the business of judging people. I am a descriptivist. Everyone in linguistics is a descriptivist and we do not give a shit, right? <laughs> we, we, if you say something that sounds interesting to us, we might go, ooh, ooh, you use an interesting participle there or something like that. But we will not go, we will not stop a conversation in order to say no, no, you know, no participles of that kind. That is verboten. No, that is not what linguists get up to, okay? And it's very important for you uh, to, to be, I think, to adopt this mindset, S especially in view of what I've just said, right? These varieties, these standard varieties, they come to being the way they are because of historical privilege. And the groups that speak these languages, that use these languages, uh, that have command, that are associated with these languages, are privileged groups. Uh, and it's actually good sometimes to be able to challenge that, to, to say, where does this privilege come from? Why do they have it? And what is so much better about this standard variety of the language? Um, so, you know, we need to be careful with this standard. You know, many of you, I think, will probably go on to become teachers, and you will be teaching in schools the standard. But you need to, you need to be aware, of course, that it's not better than other linguistic varieties, it simply happens to be the one that has kind of made it to success, right? Um, it's just, it's got to where it is um, through complex socio-historical processes. Okay, um, so um, now we can talk a little bit about this process of standardization, how a standard language emerges. Um, and focusing now on simply the spelling, there's a lot to be said about standardization. We'll talk about it more when we come to the early modern English period in the course. Um, the alphabet you've already seen. Um, so Old and Middle English scribes uh, used a modified Roman alphabet. So we saw these extra letters like the thorn and the ash, this A and the E that are mashed together, um, that we find in the Old English texts. Uh, and in Middle English, we find these to a limited extent too, until what we're left with after the Middle English period is just the modern uh, Latin alphabet. 
Uh, but what we also find in Middle English and in Old English um, is that uh, there is a lot of variation. So people don't really seem to care about everything being spelt in the same way. So let's take the word a psalm, right? Um, this word is spelt in Old English sealm or S E A L M, S E L M, S A L M, S P A L M E. I'm not sure where that one came from. Uh, S P H A L M E. Uh, all of these variants are found in the Old English texts. Now, when you get to the end of the Middle English period, things start to change. Um, and these changes have to do, again, with the sort of socio-political circumstances. So in the Middle English period, Midlands English, the language of the Midlands of uh, England, became very important. Um, and the, the chancery, which is a, uh, a body, an institution, uh, that produces a lot of official documents, uh, up until 1420, they started, they were producing these documents in Latin. Right, so they weren't using English at all. English wasn't high status enough for them. Right? They wanted to use Latin because that was the language of education up until this point. In 1420, that changes. They start using English. But when they use English, they do so in a very systematic way. They start to make sure they... Um, uh, partly uh, organically and partly artificially, all of these chancery scribes start writing in the same way. Um, and uh, that, because it's a very influential variety of English, this is a very high status variety, because they produce these official documents, uh, that is very influential. Um, this is still quite free. They still have a lot of flexibility in the chancery, but they also start developing some rules. So, for instance, in the English word high, this word, um, it just means um, something that is, um, uh, I'm trying to paraphrase it, um, up and really, uh, hoch is the German word, right? Yes. Okay. But in, in hoch, this final consonant is actually pronounced, whereas in high, it's not. You've just got an I diphthong, right? You've got these vowels. You don't say heig or heig or anything like that. Not at this stage, not in the, early, not in the late Middle English period. Um, but the chancery had an important role because they started to say, well, we're always going to write this GH even though it isn't pronounced. So if you're looking for someone to blame for that, you blame the chanceries, blame the Middle English chanceries. This has an influence then on the printing press because the, when Caxton starts printing in London, he starts printing close to the chancery and they start producing the same document many, many times. So you've got this hugely influential center of the chancery and the Caxton printing press in London, very close to one another, churning out documents that are going all across the English speaking world. And that starts to have an effect uh, on people's perceptions uh, of how the language ought to be used. And then fairly swiftly after that, you start getting the first English dictionaries being produced. Uh, and fairly swiftly after that, you get the King James Bible, uh, which is a classic English Bible. I showed you a segment of the, of the Bible, uh, the King James Bible earlier on. Um, what's quite striking about this Bible um, is actually how modern it looks in some ways. So um, the actual spelling um, is not so far off exactly the same as what we would see in the modern day language. Uh, and that's no accident either, because this document, because it was so influential, would have had a huge influence on the usage of the day, at least the written usage. So you can see, hopefully, how this standard would have arisen. Um, and so the situation that we're in by the early 17th century, that is by about 1612, is this. Um, the standard is beginning to develop. We have a standard that's, that we've got. Uh, the, the spelling habits, the spelling customs, are more or less crystallized by this point. And then, um, possibly, actually, um, this is a slightly too early, it goes on longer than this, you get this great vowel shift. Uh, and what the great vowel shift is, it basically takes all of the vowels and changes them. And they all start being pronounced in different ways. Um, 
So um, the main bit that needs to concern you right now is that long a, e, i, u, and o become e, i, i, au, and u, respectively. Right? Um, so uh, so this, um, this chart shows you some of these varieties. But for instance, the word name would have been pronounced uh, nama. Uh, and that might sound familiar to you uh, in certain ways, if you're speakers of German. Um, now, then various things happen. The, the main one is the great vowel shift. Obviously, um, this falls off, this schwa as they tend to. Um, they, they just um, tend to disappear after a while. Um, and then here you get um, this vowel, this ah vowel, moving upwards and becoming a. Right? Um, so then in the, uh, in, later in the period, you get name. Uh, and that you will still hear in certain varieties. For instance, in Yorkshire English, people still pronounce name like that, right? In the standard, we would say name. I say the standard, the Queen's English, um, or my English, uh, because I'm fairly posh and uh, middle class, and uh, I have most of the privilege and all of that. Um, so uh, I would say name in a very standard way. Um, and, but that makes it obviously really annoying uh, for people trying to learn the, the mapping between the spelling and uh, the the phonology. Um, now, obviously, at least this, this great vowel shift is, is relatively predictable. Um, it's relatively um, regular. So all of the words with these sounds in are affected in the same way. The regularity of sound change is really important. We'll come back to that in future lectures. Um, so, for instance, it's not just nama. This word bait uh, starts out as something like bata, uh, and then it would become uh, beta, or oh, bait, and then it would become bait, as in uh, the modern language. Uh, beat starts out as bait and becomes bait, and then becomes beat. Um, and bite starts out as beat and then becomes bite. Um, so basically, the net effect of this vowel change is to throw a huge spanner into the works of English spelling. So now, all of these beautiful correspondences that speakers of other uh, languages with the Latin alphabet are used to have been completely messed up by this vowel shift. Um, I'm not even going to start talking about why the vowel shift happened. Uh, we can come back to that maybe later on. Uh, but for now, it's sufficient to notice that it happened. And it wasn't the only thing that messed up English spelling. The other thing, one of the main things, is uh, etymological respelling. So the word debt, right? You, you know this word, you, you pay your debts, right? This word is pronounced debt, there's a t. There is nowhere to be seen a b, right? No one in the English-speaking world would say debt or something like that. Um, or at least if they did, I would laugh at them um, for a long time. Um, but. Um, the crucial thing is, interestingly, in the Middle English period, it was written debt. But then someone had the bright idea, ah, but this word is really derived from the Latin debits. Uh, so we must put the B back in when we spell it, because we need to look clever, right? We need to look really clever. If we know Latin, we look maximally clever. All right, so we've got a B in debt. Thanks, scribes. That's really helpful. Again, you've messed up our language, and we have to live with the consequences. And it's not only this. Other, other words that get borrowed, phoenix, quota. Um, now, if you think about, we could easily, we could spell this KW, right? But we don't. And again, it's because history, you know? Shit happens. So, Phoenix, um, also, you know, PH, this is a, no one says Phoenix or anything like that, right? This is a Phoenix with an F. Um, so, it's quite important um, that English scribes never really saw any point in changing the orthography of the language, the spelling of the language, to make it match uh, the pronunciation in any way.
And of course, another factor here is that in uh, the UK, um, we've never had anything like, the, uh, like a spelling reform. So I know um, that uh, not so long ago, or at least um, not so long ago in my lifespan, uh, there was a Rechtschreibreform in Germany, and everyone got all kinds of excited about it because it re regulated what you could do with double S's and that kind of thing. Um, and the net effect of it was supposed to be to make the spelling more sensible. Now, if you think about English, who would do that? Right. First of all, we don't have a body that, that regulates the English language. Other languages, you do have these bodies who at least try to. In Italy, you've got the Academia della Crusca. In France, you've got the Académie Française. Um, in, in, uh, in Germany, you've got various bodies that try to regulate the language. They're not always entirely successful. Um, in England, I mean, and, and there, there is already the first problem because we're not just talking about England. Right? If you try to make the spelling of English representative of the pronunciation of English, then you immediately have the question, which English? Right? Do you change the spelling to make it match how American English is pronounced? Everyone in my country would go mental if that happened. They would be so furious. They'd say, the queen, the queen, it's so important that we retain our, our heritage. Um, what happens, I mean, what you can't then make it match British spelling because who cares about British spelling, right? Britain isn't important. British, Britain's just a stupid little island in the sea, right? And, and you know, they're sort of floating away into the mid-Atlantic these days. Um, but um, so, you know, um, the, there would be probably some kind of riot if anyone tried to regulate the spelling of the English language. And partly because of that, maybe, no one ever has. People, it's not that people haven't proposed it. So the author, you may know of Jonathan Swift, the uh, early modern author, Jonathan Swift, the writer of Gulliver's Travels. Uh, he once wanted to reform, to have a body that would regulate the English language in this way, uh, but he was unsuccessful. And for, some, for whatever reason, it's never really caught on, the idea of regulating the English language. Um, and, you know, in, in, in one sense, that's great because freedom, anarchy, expression. But on the other hand, it means that the spelling system of English is a complete mess. And it always will be, probably. Okay, um, any questions about that? Right, so hopefully that's illustrated how a historical explanation can shed light on some rather mysterious facts about the present day English language. Um, and. Uh, whether or not you find it satisfying, this is more or less what happened. Uh, and the spelling of English uh, and its complete insanity starts to make a little bit more sense when you look at it from that perspective. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit before the end of the lecture about the themes of the course. So the kind of things that we'll be coming back to over and over again uh, over the next 12 weeks. Uh, and there are really three of them. Why is English not more... German-like? Why is it not more Germanic? As I've said before, English is a language that comes from Germanic tribes. If you go back far enough, there was no English. There were Angles, there were Saxons. They all spoke mutually intelligible varieties. They were in present-day Germany and Denmark. Um, it wouldn't have made much sense, for instance, in the second century AD, to talk about English or German or anything like that, there was just some kind of West Germanic language that then later split into English, Frisian, Dutch, uh, you know, um, Schweizerdeutsch, uh, uh, and, and all of other kinds of uh, weird uh, things that you find. Um, so um, in uh, the history of English, it has become rather un-Germanic in certain ways that we'll come back to. Another theme is uh, synthetic languages versus analytic languages. That's something I'll explain in a minute. And then internal versus external, internal factors, internal history versus external factors and external history. So to start with the first of these questions, often English doesn't look very Germanic. English is a language that seems to have abandoned its roots in some ways. So, first of all, in English we have this word dentist, right? Dentist is someone who fixes your teeth. 
uh, and then charges you quite a lot of money to do so usually. Um, in, in English, we've got this word dentist. This is completely non-transparent, right? It's, um, un, it's, it's actually um, a uh, Latin or French word in origin. Um, now, every other Germanic language, language has a word that actually makes sense for this thing, right? Um, so, in German, for instance, um, you know, if you've got a broken tan, you go to a specific arzt, and that arzt is someone who can fix your tan. So, therefore, it is a tan arzt, right? Um, this is why I like German, okay? German sometimes makes sense. Um, Dutch, tand arts, um, I'm not even going to try and pronounce the Danish or the Swedish, but they have the same principle, right? A word for tooth and a word for doctor, because it's a doctor who fixes your teeth. What could be simpler than that? No, not for English, no. We have this special word. Fine, okay, dentist. Why, why? Well, well, you'll see. You will see. But for now, here's another point. Old English, here's a sentence of Old English, a made-up sentence, admittedly. But when you look at it, compare it to the, to the German here and to the modern English. Which looks more similar to you? Right. There are many, many things going on here. So here we have the Old English, ich habe hier geholpen. Right? Ich, it's very similar to ich, right? And in modern, modern English, partly because of this stupid great vowel shift, we have I, I. The Heber, we have a B here. Uh, in modern English, that's somehow become a V. Um, and then over here, there's all kinds of stuff going on. Um, so look at these two words. Isn't that beautiful? They're basically just the same word, except with German, there's this F thing that comes in. Uh, but, you know, the other thing that's really important here is the word order. So uh, you have this verb final word order. That crops up in Old English, and it crops up in German. But in modern English, it's completely ungrammatical. I have her helped completely out. So in modern English, we've got what we call a verb object structure, VO. Uh, whereas in Old English and in, in modern German, you've got OV, at least with these non-finite verbs. That's, that's significant, right? And the general picture is one in which Old English looks quite a lot like German in certain ways, and then it gradually becomes much less like German. And then you want to know why. Because obviously German is still like German, so if it's fine for Germans, why is it not fine for us? What do, why does English need to change? Well, many things happened in the intervening period, and that's one of the really interesting questions. Why has English changed uh, in the ways that it has? And this relates to the other two themes, uh, because one of them is language internal versus language external factors. Internal change, we're talking about change that is linguistically motivated here. So some sounds are simply easier to pronounce in certain contexts than others. Um, if you try and pronounce a m mm sound, uh, it's easier to do it before a p than it is before a k. Mm -p versus m mm k. And you can feel if you try and make those sounds, what you're doing is your tongue is moving between the m and the k, right? M and p are both bilabial sounds. They're made with the two lips coming together. K, on the other hand, is made at the back of the mouth. It's velar, uh, to use the phonetic terminology. So when you pronounce it, you have to change your place of articulation. Um, and now on the grounds that uh, speakers uh, prefer least effort, or rather, least effort is something that just happens. We don't want to be lazy necessarily, but sometimes we just are. Um, you get change happening because if everyone starts to pronounce uh, sounds in a certain way because of ease of articulation uh, and it catches on, then you've got a language change on your hands. Children have an important role to play here because every generation of children has to acquire their language from scratch. We talk about the English language as if it was some sort of object floating through time. But the reality of it is there really is no English language in that sense. What do we have? Um, well, we have individual speakers and hearers, and they know, they have knowledge of the language, they produce language, but there is no sort of magical object somewhere out there that's the English language. We just have this sequence of transmission.
You know, we teach our children, or rather, our children learn uh, the language from us, and then they end up having their own children and teaching it to their children, and so on and so forth. Uh, and if children uh, make mistakes when they're acquiring the language, um, if they uh, make certain changes in certain directions, then the language as a whole can change, insofar as there even is a language as a whole in that sense. It gets quite philosophical at that level. Um, prescriptivists are often quite uh, vehement in their opposition to this kind of internal change. Uh, but usually it's fairly futile to try and stop a change from taking hold in a language. Uh, it's very rare that prescriptivists have been successful in doing so. Um, if you're interested uh, in finding out more about that, um, there is a, uh, a great book Fixing English by Anne Curzon um, that is very readable uh, and really uh, digs deep into the history of prescriptivists' attempts to change the English language for the better. Um, so uh, you can find out more about that there. Um, external change, on the other hand, this is change that we can think of as having a cause that is extra-linguistic. It is outside the language. Sometimes, for instance, historical need. So in the modern English language, uh, we have a word for a goji berry. We never previously needed a word for a goji berry because we did not have goji berries. We didn't need a word for iPads in 1954, because we did not have iPads, this is externally motivated change. New word, new thing. But sometimes it's more complex than that. So similarly here, um, Brexit, right? Um, we have this word Brexit, and prior to about 2016, we didn't really need a word for the idea of Britain leaving the European Union because everyone thought it would be a really stupid idea. Well, uh, or at least uh, it wasn't seen as a very realistic prospect, let's put it that way, more politically neutral. Um, so um, these words come into the language because we need them in a certain way, but it's not always need. Identity can be a very powerful motivator in linguistic forms. Language contact can be an incredibly powerful motivator. Geography can be important. Um, so for instance, if there's a big ocean between two sets of populations, then often their languages will diverge quite dramatically from one another because they're not in regular contact. Seems like it makes sense. In English, in the history of English, there is, on the whole, been fairly little prescriptive opposition to external change. So English borrows words from many languages, and most of the time, prescriptivists don't really mind. There is a period during the early modern uh, period um, called the Inkhorn Controversy, where people do start getting angry about loan words. Um, but for the most part, English has been fairly happy uh, to borrow from various different languages. And here you can see some of the big players. Um, now, this is a very, very rough timeline. And um, one thing that you must bear in mind is that not all of these contact influences are the same kind of contact. You can think of which of the languages has the most prestige, for instance, in these instances. Um, and it can really vary. Um, so, but the general principle is that before the Germanic tribes left the continent, they were in contact with the Roman Empire. So there was Latin influence at that point. And from Latin, we borrowed words such as street and abbot. Uh, later on, uh, when the British tribes came to uh, the United, when the, sorry, when the Germanic tribes came to uh, the British Isles, uh, you get Celtic. The Celtic languages start influencing uh, the uh, Old English language. Uh, and that is a topic of very, very hot debate at the moment. What exactly was the nature of that contact? What happened to all of these Celtic speakers? And uh, we may come back to that a bit. Um, if you're doing my uh, Xi 3 course on uh, uh, Anglo-Saxons, Celts, and Vikings, uh, then uh, that will be something that we will explore in more detail. Uh, Vikings, they're the next lot. You get uh, Norse uh, 
invaders, raiders, then settlers coming to the British Isles um, and speaking Scandinavian languages. These are Germanic languages too, but they're North Germanic languages rather than West Germanic languages. Uh, these languages would have been very closely related to modern Danish, Norwegian, Swedish, Icelandic even. Um, after 1066, the famous 1066, the Norman Conquest, um, you get influence from what's usually called French. Um, it's a very spe specific form of French. This is Anglo-Norman French, um, not just French French. Um, so uh, that has important facts as well. But words like judge uh, come from French. And then you get Latin coming in as well, uh, because that was the high status language. So complicated words like emancipate. And from the early modern period, when you get the Renaissance, the rediscovery of uh, classical wisdom, Greek starts to become a popular source of words as well. Um, after that, you get various, what I've roughly labelled, uh, colonial influences. These are uh, languages of the peoples that the British Empire uh, decided to uh, come and help. Um, and uh, these languages had some influence on the British, uh, on uh, English until today, uh, and are still doing so uh, to an extent. Uh, and as for now, who knows? There's various things happening to the English language. It's very difficult to predict where a language will be tomorrow or in 10 years' time, let alone in 100 years' time. When we look at these loan words, um, there are different estimates. But what's interesting here is that um, these mostly, uh, the more common words you look at, the more of them have an Old English origin. Um, so if you start up here, Oh, sorry. Um, um, if you start here, uh, in the top 1,000 most commonly used words, 83% of them are from Old English. Right. Um, and uh, then 11% of them are from French, 2% are from Latin, and 4% from various other sources, including Norse and Greek. Um, this number goes down dramatically if you look at the top 2,000 words. Um, so then it's only 34 uh, 29% for the top 3,000 words, and then again it levels out at around 30%. So only about 30% of the English vocabulary, in some counts, really comes from English originally, really comes from its Germanic roots. The rest comes from various other places. French is a big contributor. As you can see, uh, it's in the most common words, it's not very well represented. But when you start getting less common, maybe 45% of the words come from French. And as for Latin, it gets dramatically more common the rarer you go. And if you were to look at, let's say, the top 50,000 words, probably most of them would be very specific Latin or Greek words that most people would never use. Right. So this is the general overview uh, of uh, the, the words in the language. To, to see a specific case study, I picked this one because it has certain current relevance. So here, um, certain uh, of my illustrious compatriots decided that they were going to launch a petition to the UK government to remove all French words from the cover of a new British passport. Right? They were not happy with the fact that if you look at a British passport, it has a motto on it like, Dieu est mon droit or on y soit qui mal y pense. Uh, these are on there, and they're on there for historical reasons, essentially. Um, now, these people created a petition to try and get rid of the French words in, uh, on the British passports. Now, what's quite ironic about this is that in the petition itself, quite a lot of the words come from French. So, for instance, all of these blue underlined words are French words in origin. Passport itself is a French word, passeport, passeport. Uh, these words are French. So, um, you've got remove, that's a French word in origin. Cover, control, French words. I mean, this is a, a huge proportion of the petition that these people are using. Uh, so either these people are impervious to the irony um, of using French words in order to argue against the use of French words, um, or, or else they've got some very strange plan. I don't know. Anyway, fortunately, there aren't very many of them. This petition was not successful. Um, but it, it's good that it's not successful, because um, it's not only French words. Um, it's other languages, too. The word motto, that's an Italian word. 
Um, these words, the word take, that's actually uh, a Norse word. It comes from Scandinavian. A verb as common as that, and it comes from the Scandinavian uh, contact. Um, and then other words, uh, so British, as we've said, is a word that comes from Celtic, possibly via Latin or vice versa. Um, the word there, uh, this pronoun there, uh, possessive, um, this is, it, it's widely agreed, though not universally agreed, that this word comes from Scandinavian as well. So, as you can see from this, English has borrowed huge numbers of words from all of the other languages that it's come into contact with. It's done so extremely liberally. Um, what's interesting then is, is to look at what's left. So, a roughly half of the words in this paragraph are of foreign origin, and the other half uh, come from Old English and from Germanic, from you know, the Germanic ancestor, which we'll talk more about next time. But, um, and I've been very generous here, right? I've counted words like EU as words that come from Old English, which is not really, you know, doesn't really mean anything. But at least it doesn't obviously come from anywhere else either, particularly. Union, again, French or Latin. Right? Um, but the point here is that the words, the common words, the little words, they're the words that you get uh, that come from Old English. So, to, the, and, have, in, for, right? These little grammatical words are the ones that we see the most often um, from English, from Old English itself, right? In terms of when we start actually looking at the nouns and the verbs, they're mostly from other languages, in fact, or at least a lot of them are. So that's external change. Internal change, then, um, as we've seen in the great vowel shift, part of what might motivate this kind of change is that vowels tend to be distributed fairly evenly in the space of possible vowels. But there are possible external motivations too, so we're not going to dwell on this in too much detail. The crucial principle is that actually we can study present day language changes, um, because language change is going on all around us all the time, and we can use that to understand the changes that have happened in the past. This is something called uniformitarianism. The idea that language history can be understood uh, in the best possible way by looking at language change in the present day. Uh, and as I've said before, certain kinds of sound change, assimilation for instance, uh, is very common. Various different varieties uh, have a process of appenthesis. This is where you stick an extra vowel in, so the word milk will often be pronounced milk, milk, uh, with an extra vowel between the l and the k, because of a natural tendency to break up complicated consonant clusters. So there are various different possible internal motivations for change too. Um, as for this synthetic versus analytic divide, this is something that we're going to have to come back to in much greater detail later on in the course. Um, but the basic distinction is this. A synthetic language is one in which features, semantic features, grammatical features, subject, objects, that kind of thing, are marked mostly by morphological endings and less by separate words or word order. An analytic language is a language in which these semantic features are mostly marked by separate words and by fixed, strict, rigid word order. And the, the paradigm example of an analytic language is Chinese, where there is really no morphology, every word is its own separate thing. Well, there's a little bit of morphology, but we can pretend that there isn't any. Um, and Navajo, on the other hand, has huge amounts of morphology, really long, fat words. Um, and English has become much more analytic over its history. And one of the big questions that we'll be touching upon repeatedly throughout the course is why that would be. And it relates to both of the other themes, obviously, because it relates to this interplay between internal and external factors, and it relates to the question of why has English moved away from its Germanic roots. So, in summary, English has changed. It's changed a lot, and we're going to explore those changes. Um, we've got the three main historical periods. We're going to explore them sequentially. Uh, so we're actually going to start with the prehistoric period in two weeks' time, uh, and then move on to Old English, Middle English, and Early Modern English. And we've touched upon these three themes. For you, uh, now, this week, normally, there will be a tutorial every week when there is a lecture. 
This week, because this is the introductory week, there is no tutorial. Uh, and if you want something to do, then you can go away and read the textbook. Chapters 1 and 2 uh, will recapitulate some of the material that we've covered today uh, and will prepare you for the rest of the course. And next time, so in two weeks' time, I will see you again uh, for the lecture on the pre-Old English period. And that's it. <laughs>